I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, uh, starting at the end. Dave Julian, photographer and uh, illustrator and workshop instructor here in Seattle and all over. Justin Staley, I'm the senior product manager for Fujifilm for the X-Series cameras. Brian Smith, I'm a celebrity portrait photographer out of Miami. Uh, Matt Fraser, I'm the national training manager for Panasonic. I'm Mark Weir, I'm the senior technical manager for Sony's digital imaging group. So what we're doing today is we're gonna talk about the, the, the recent trend, I suppose the recent development of a product segment which wasn't necessarily there before, which is increasingly compact cameras, small cameras, fixed and interchangeable lens cameras with bigger and bigger sensors. So we're seeing the development of the sensor size as a differentiator for the first time. Um, so we're gonna talk that through both from the perspective of the manufacturers, how do you make that possible and why? And also from photographers, what makes it more, what makes it a valuable uh, thing for a camera to have, compact form factor and a big sensor. So I suppose the first thing I'll, I'll do is ask the manufacturers, um, starting with with, with you, um, Matt. What are the traditionally speaking? What are the challenges of making uh, a small, pocketable but high quality camera? <laughs> that's a that's a, it's very, a big question. A very sorry, big question. So we got an hour, right? Um, <laughs> okay. Obviously, building a high-quality compact camera's primary limitation is going to be sensor size. I mean, as the sensor gets bigger, the optics have to get bigger. If the optics have to get bigger, the camera has to get bigger. So the challenge ultimately came down to finding an equilibrium where we could fit a larger sensor camera and then have the technology advance enough in optics design to allow us to be able to reduce optic sizes to allow them to be partnered with those larger sensors. It's probably the easiest answer I could give you. So, um, Mark, I know you and I were talking about lens design, specifically around the, the requirements for large sensor and also for video. Would you agree? Sure. Um, again, the part that is difficult for many to understand is the relationship is between the size of the lens and the size of the image sensor. Uh, lens technology is advancing quite a bit, but nonetheless, the, if the optical cir circle is going to cover a full-frame image sensor, the lens itself is going to be fairly large. So if the lens is large, there are limitations to uh, the size of the camera as well. But even so, um, what we've seen in the industry just over the last year or two in terms of getting larger sensors into smaller cameras is really quite revolutionary. Uh, I don't think anyone would have ever expected um, very large sensors and very small cameras uh, that we see today. Full frame cameras that can fit in a jacket pocket, for instance, would have been impossible two or three years ago. So what, what are the key, I mean, let's take the full frame camera, let's take the, the A7 Alpha 7 series as an example. I mean, what were the key technological breakthroughs which, which had to happen before you could create that kind of product? Well, much of it is in mechanical miniaturization. Uh, needless to say, uh, mirrorless design is an essential ingredient of being able to make a camera body this small with a full frame image sensor uh, because if you're going to put a mirror box in front of the image sensor, it's certainly going to significantly increase the size of the camera. So that's the depth of difference with the DSLR, right? There's a mirror, there's a prism. Sure. But this is, these, these are all mirrorless cameras. In fact, there's no mirror, there's no prism. So it makes everything smaller. Yeah, and with a full frame camera with a moving mirror, the mirror is larger, the prism is larger, everything gets larger. Um, and with uh, a mirrorless design, we can move back to the days of 35 millimeter film rangefinder cameras, where it was not unusual to find uh, cameras that were really quite small. Mm -hmm. um, it's only with uh, moving mirror uh, SLRs that we find full frame image sensors uh, causing the camera to be very, very large. Um, we started the journey pretty much with uh, the RX-1. Um, this camera, it was very, very difficult for people to understand that it ha had a full frame image sensor inside because the lens wasn't removable to see it. Um, and, and it's not that much bigger than, than the, the compacts, than the zoom compact. Yeah, and uh, obviously the lens design was a real challenge with this camera to keep the lens and the camera body size very, very small. But then uh, we followed that up with the Alpha 7 series uh, first last year and then the A7S um, uh, earlier this summer. But again, the idea is uh, to provide the photographer with all of the advantages that larger image sensors bring without necessarily taking up the bulk of uh, cameras that offered that in the past. So Justin, let's talk about Fujifilm for a second in the X-Series. I mean, this is, I think I'm right in saying this is at least, if, if not the newest, one of the very newest lens lineups in the industry. I mean, what made you, and it's based on an APS-C sensor format, I mean, what led Fujifilm to that decision as opposed to 
four thirds as opposed to one inch or full frame? Uh, I think it really was finding a balance point. I mean, we're talking about lens size, body size. Um, all those things are so tied together that I think in thinking about the future of the system, the way the camera works, the size of the camera, that, that APS-C size format for us seemed like a perfect spot. And going larger with the sensor, forcing larger lenses, forcing a larger body, it kind of became, well, where's the magic spot? And I think that, I mean, I think with the original X100, we hit a home run. And I think we, you know, keep evolving that process out with the X100T now, um, and then adapting that into that changeable lens. But yeah, it's been an evolution. It's been designing uh, roughly 19 new lenses to cover that format, specifically, you know, with those parameters in place and not being tied. I think that's something that's really important with all the cameras here, not being tied to an SLR style platform, having compatibility with SLR style platform lenses but our systems weren't legacy systems. We've brought new things to the marketplace. We've allowed the system to be digital and not be an analog digital crossover. From the word go, from the very beginning. From the, from the very beginning, yeah. So when you're planning a system, and this is a question I think for, for all three of you, but I'll, I'll start with Justin. When you're planning to create a new system, I mean, we have photographers here, Brian and, and David have joined us. What kind of questions do you ask them? I mean, how do you figure out what you should do? I mean, you, you must go to photographers and say, what do you want? Sorry, Matt, I'll, I'll start with um, I mean, obviously, I think it starts with understanding a market position that's not currently being filled. Mm -hmm. So when Panasonic developed our first mirrorless camera in 2008, uh, we didn't see anything other than Leica that was in the space with a mirrorless product. Uh, certainly not something that was cost effective for the average consumer to be able to buy. So you start with an idea of, you know, this market niche needs to be filled potentially. And then you start to ask photographers, you know, well, what would happen if we remove the mirror box? What would your experience be with the product? How is that going to affect your ability to shoot? And as they start to think about it, they realize, well, doesn't really help me a whole lot to have it in place. It just sort of is a legacy from film and, and the need to be able to see through the lens. That was sort of the first step, is just asking, if we remove this, is this going to negatively impact your photography? Um, what we found is that, really, other than sports photography, most photographers didn't really need that ability to have through the lens viewing. So once you start looking at it that way, you then have to sort of balance out what's your design goal. Is the design goal just to be another SLR replacement? And is your SLR replacement camera providing enough benefit to allow somebody to maybe want to switch from using SLR into your system? Um, we decided on the Micro Four Thirds standard because we know we can make the lenses substantially smaller and provide a much smaller kit, not just a smaller body. So by using the Micro Four Thirds sensor, you then begin to ask photographers, well, you know, how much are you going to miss shooting at ISO 6400 and having low noise? And a lot of photographers tell us, well, I don't usually shoot much above ISO 1600, let alone 32 or 64. So you, you, you sort of narrow down the field to where you get a product, and this is all very basic, and these guys are probably rolling their eyes right now in the back of the head saying, yeah, this is basic stuff. But th the truth is, is that if, if you can address a problem, which is camera size and camera complexity, and then ask enough people, if we do these things, will you buy the product? Chances are they're going to buy what, you, what you're producing. Just, I'm sorry, I, I cut you off earlier. How, how do you synthesize the demand from photographers into the X series? It, it's, to me, a very sort of tricky process. And um, I mean, to me, one of our focuses has always been Kaizen, has been the constant evolution of product. And. I should explain that. So that's a Japanese term which yeah. refers to constant good improvement. Yes, right. yeah. yeah. So it's constantly changing, constantly evolving, getting feedback from our customer base. What do you want? What do you need? What would help you do your job better? And looking for ways that we implement that into our cameras to, to give those services those features. But you know, it, it's always a, a delicate balancing act. It's finding features that are really useful and really meaningful to photographers. And you know, keeping to our core brand ideas and our core concepts of where we stand as a, as a, as a company and our history and our lineage and where we've been and you know, focusing on manual controls. And that's something that, that us as a brand has really, really pulled in there and used that there's something comforting. We hear from photographers all the time about how much they love these cameras and that they have soul. 
and you know, the ability to look at the top of a camera, see your f-stop, see your shutter speed, see your ISO, because they're on mechanical dials. So it's, it's taking some of those kind of, of pieces and then implementing digital sort of technology underneath it to give the, the best of both worlds, so to speak. So David, I mean, we've, you and I have talked about the kind of photography you do, travel photography, um, you know, specifically. I mean, what is the most important thing or things for you in a, in a, in a camera, in a, in a travel camera? Intuitive speed of use. And I hear from a lot of my students that the thing that engages them with a camera, if it's their first camera or their fourth camera, is how quickly they can intuitively get past the technology and go into the creativity. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Brian, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think speed of use. I think a lot of it's getting familiar with the camera. I think, uh, to me, really, in the essence, it's a, a lens and a sensor. So all the box that's been around it traditionally, getting it in a small, compact size mm -hmm. where, you know, being able to, to work with a great full-frame sensor in a small package and not having the weight that we used to have uh, gives me everything that I'm always looking for. So you mentioned weight, but as well as weight, there's also, I mean, the, the, the size of a camera is about more than just the weight. You know, people react very differently right. to a really big camera than a small yeah. one. Um, now the, the great thing about shooting with a small camera is you can be on the, st on the street doing portraits and people don't take you as a pro. and. Right and they react to it differently. So I think there's a lot to be said to smaller, uh, discrete cameras and being able to work um, very quietly um, without being noticed. So up to now, I mean, we're talking now about a new generation of cameras with one inch sensors and, and up. Um, before that point, I mean, what were the compromises for, for you starting with Brian? And what were the compromises for you when it came to going out with a discrete, small, compact camera? Well, it, to me, the, the real big difference is you know, when the first APS size sensors came out, I would shoot with those a lot. The, the original um, NEX5, when it came out, I shot with that on the street all the time. But other times it's like if I wanted to use my traditional lenses and have a full frame sensor, I would take the bigger DSLR. Now there's really no compromise to be able to shoot full frame the way that I want to and work very light um, and, and small. I tend to use this not just when I'm traveling, It's I still take my um, DSLRs when I go um, uh, on commercial shoots, but typically the A99 only comes out if there's some particular need for it, and this is what I shoot with all the time. And that's, uh, what, do you, what do you have there? This is the uh, A7R, so it's kind of remarkable that this small camera has more resolution than the medium format digital back I had when I switched over. So. Things are changing very nicely. Well, we were in the last panel segment, we were just talking about the speed of technological advance and yeah. resolution and processing power. Uh, so, David, what do you, when you go traveling, what do you shoot with? What do you take? Well, uh, most recently, I was traveling in Alaska, and um, I was taking some full-frame DSLRs and some variety of lenses. And because it was a workshop, I also wanted to bring some compact cameras, and you were kind enough to lend me a wonderful one. And I'll tell you, I loved the freedom and speed at which I could capture things. And not always up here, often down here. I'm a big lover of the tilting LCD because it gives me a lot of flexibility on where my body is, where the subject is, what I don't want to get too close to. Um, so for me, um, creative flexibility, and the, the more they come out with features for these, the more attracted I am to that genre. So we lent you a uh, Canon, for the benefit of the audience, we lent you a Canon G1X2, right. yeah. which is the second generation of Canon's yeah. almost APS-C, but not quite, fixed lens compact. I mean, what was the difference for you between using a camera like that and what you've been used to before? Um, for me, I found, well, instantly, I found the picture quality amazing on that camera. I also loved having twin dials on the front of that lens and be able to control aperture, speed, and a number of other things I could program into it. So I quickly learned the camera. It was mm -hmm. very intuitive to learn, and I was able to capture the images I wanted without much difficulty on a brand new camera to me. So, yeah. So let's talk, we, we talked a little bit initially about the, um, the technology behind what we're, we're calling this new generation of cameras, small form factor, big sensors. Um, and uh, we touched on optical design, but Mark, what are the, the, over the past few years, what are the big developments in optics that have really made these things possible? Well, I think that there's uh, two different parts. One is the development of the lens technology necessary for uh, mirrorless cameras. Um, and a lot of this has to do with uh, the bridging from still photography to video. 
um, SLR, conventional traditional SLR lens design is based around phase detect autofocus, which SLRs have been built with for nearly 30 years. And uh, that's not particularly well um, compatible, if you will, with the focusing systems in mirrorless cameras, which require focus groups which are very light and um, very agile mm -hmm. so that they can be moved back and forth very, very quickly so that contrast AF can lock focus very, very rapidly, um, uh, in some cases uh, just as quickly as phase detect. So you have lenses with focus groups that are designed to be very small and move very quickly. Um, electrical iris control that's silent because obviously if you're changing uh, exposure or uh, AF uh, while shooting video, you can't have the mechanisms that are uh, common to most all SLR designed lenses. So that kind of development took place pretty much three or four years ago. And that has proliferated through most of the lens designs that are used with mirrorless cameras. It's a very important part. Optically, the challenge has been to make lenses that are you know, a whole factor smaller than there are comparable models for comparable uh, size image sensors. And obviously the one that's probably the easiest to compare is full frame because there's so, so many full frame cameras that have existed for so many years. And part of this is due to uh, removing the mirror box. If you can reduce the flange back from the lens flange to the image sensor, um, the retrofocus design of the lens can be significantly simplified. Think of what a 35 millimeter f1.4 lens on an SLR looks like, and then think of what a 35 millimeter f1.4 lens on a film rangefinder camera looks like, and you can easily see uh, how it, 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 it helps with the lens design and the lens miniaturization if you can reduce the distance from the back of the lens to the imaging plane. But the other side of it is um, the development of glass molding technology that's happened just pretty much in the last year or two. It, it, for a while, finding uh, lenses with numerous uh, aspheric elements in them or numerous ED glass elements in them would be um, very unusual and certainly very expensive. But nowadays, with the glass molding technology that's beginning to proliferate, um, you know, a lens like this can have three or four different um, aspheric elements in it, two or three ED elements in it. And this helps significantly reduce the size of the lens while at the same time the uh, mechanisms of the lens, the iris and the autofocus, uh, are also silent. So that kind of lens development uh, has really led to you know, the, the, uh, the breadth of uh, availability of cameras like this. But another area that we're going to see very soon as these cameras, these kinds of cameras shoot video, is we'll also see lenses appear that are parfocal. They can maintain um, their uh, angle of view uh, consistently, even with changes in plane of focus. Um, uh, Axial placement will remain the same even during operation. So can you just, for the benefit of those of those of us uh, who don't completely understand these terms, can you just explain what parfocal means in sure. these terms? Sure. Um, what what is not really recognized because interchangeable lenses um, in cameras are typically not used for video. I mean, they are increasingly, but. Um, many may not be familiar with the limitations, is that when you change the, f uh, the focal length in a zoom lens, um, the plane of focus will move. Right. And also... Focus breathing, I think, is also yeah, called. Yeah, focus breathing. I love that term. <laughs> and then uh, a another challenge is uh, to maintain the angle of view while shifting the plane of focus. So in video, for instance, you may uh, uh, change from a protagonist in the foreground to um, uh, you know, an actor in the, and have a rack focus shot from near to far, for instance. If the lens changes its field of view while changing its plane of focus, you're going to see that in video. It has no effect at all on still photography, but a profound effect on video. So using conventional still design lenses for video can therefore be very challenging. And what we'll see as lens technology advances is lenses appear that have the qualities that video-centric or cinema-centric lenses have had all along, uh, but they'll become available for uh, mainstream users. Uh, cinema lenses are typically factors of 10 more expensive than comparable still lenses, but we'll see those sorts of lenses appearing uh, as the lens technology makes it possible. 
Let's talk about uh, cost for a minute. I mean, one thing which is very evident in uh, this generation of cameras is that they're not, they're not cheap. I mean, they're aimed at people who have a little bit of spending power. It's clear the technology in them costs money. I mean, Matt, from Panasonic's point of view, how much does what you'll ultimately have to charge for the product, how much does that factor into the research and development? If you something asked, like the LX100. <coughs> if, you, if you would have asked me that question about five years ago, it would have been uh, incredibly important to factor cost right. into the design. Um, the cell phone is really obliterated much of the entry level of the marketplace. So now it's just a question of, can we build a product that photo enthusiasts will be passionate about and want to shoot with and build it the best way we can first and make certain that we can hit our design goals? So in the case of a camera like an LX100, would we have brought this to market at $2,000? Probably not. It wouldn't make sense in the marketplace. But with the technologies that we've developed in aspheric molding uh, of our lenses, the ability to put aspheric surfaces on both sides of the element, um, just lowering costs as we were discussed earlier, to be able to bring a product like this to market with as fast a lens as it has at a $900 price point, there really was nothing in the market that could do what this is capable of doing. And so when you look at the fact that there is nothing really in market with this size of sensor, with this kind of glass and this size, it was a no-brainer to bring it to market since we can do it at a $900 price point. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a, a micro four-thirds sensor with a variable aspect, variable aspect ratio. Correct. So it, it, the goal is to look at the market and say, is there enough passion for this sensor size, for this kind of a, a, an aperture in the lens, for this kind of focal length? Is there enough demand for it? Will the market pay for it? And is there enough value to, to offset you know, building it? So you know, obviously we have a GX7, and fundamentally they're the same basic camera when you talk about the aperture of the lens and the focal length of the product. You could even buy the lens for the price of this camera for a GX7. So it, it makes perfect sense from a value standpoint to bring this to market because there's plenty of people who would love to shoot with a 24 to 70 f2.8 constant lens. Oftentimes they don't because they either can't afford it or they can't afford the weight that they're going to have to carry around with them. So that's why we chose to do it.